Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with tonight. Today we are going to talk about what I called winter gardening, but in reality is just what do you do for your plants that have been brought inside or plants that are already inside and how do you take care of them during the winter months? Now, I will warn you, I am an entomologist. There is going to be a lot of focus on insects during this, but we will talk a little bit about watering, fertilizing, um, how to keep an eye on the plants, and just look at a f just, uh, I think, three plants individually and just some tips on how to take care of them. Now, I am going to remind you guys that a lot of you are going to have your own tips and tricks on how you handle these. So a lot of this may be just confirming what you already know. Some of it may be information you've never heard before. Um, but if you want to share some of those tips and tricks that you picked up over time, please feel free to do so in the chat at any time. Uh, we all benefit from each other's knowledge and experience here. All right, so like I said, there are going to be three main areas that I'm going to focus on this evening. We're going to be talking a lot about insects. We are going to briefly touch on disease. And we are going to be talking about the environment in which our plants are sitting in right now. So it can be broken down into pest management, observation and monitoring, and how to make the best use of the water and food that your plants are going to be receiving. Um, a lot of this may seem kind of straightforward, but as we enter wintertime, plant needs change a little bit. And we have to adjust to make sure that we account for that. So diving right into some insect pests. Unfortunately, insects are not restricted by winter or summer when it comes to indoor plants. And the insects that can strike your plants indoors are some of the nastiest ones to try to get rid of. Um, if you've ever worked in or with people in a greenhouse, you will very readily recognize a lot of these insects. Um, and they can make your life kind of miserable if you can't handle them very well. So first off, Let's take a look at one fairly well-known insect that is common in greenhouses and it can come into your home known as a white fly. White flies are very similar to leaf hoppers and tree hoppers, and they're even related to the stink bugs that you can find in your homes right now as they've been flying indoors. Now, like I said, these are very, very common pests of greenhouses and indoor growing situations, and you'll know that they're present because you'll find the stippling on the surface of the leaves and the picture that's behind this right now kind of shows what that stippling looks like a little bit. After a stippling appears, you'll see that the leaves are growing yellow. This is because these insects are sap feeders and they're going to drain out the sugars and other materials inside the plant cells and just make the plant overall more unhealthy, uh, particularly leaf surfaces. As they feed, they take in a lot of sugar and their bodies can't digest all of the sugar that, or all of the starches that they're taking in, so they'll excrete a great deal of it. The sugar, uh, often, called, often called honeydew, will allow the development of sooty mold on the surface of the leaves, so you'll see this kind of black mold begin to form over the surface of the leaf as time goes on and more white fly feeding occurs. The best thing to do, as I always tell people, is to monitor. You need to watch for the presence of white flies in order to take action on them. And a little later on, I'm going to talk about some of the methods you can use to take action against these insects. It's pretty common for all of them that we're going to talk about, with some exceptions. So the first thing to watch for is to watch for the eggs. You're going to find very tiny oval shaped eggs that are on short stalks. You're going to think they're little funny looking hairs sticking out of the plant, but they're going to be obviously different. Um, one thing that I want to encourage all of you to do is if you are going to be taking care of plants indoors, get yourself a cheap magnifying glass, something at like 10 X power. That will make it very, very easy to find um, the smaller insects or mite species and eggs and everything else. It'll save yourself a lot of headache if you get this. The next thing to look for are going to be the nymphs of this insect. They may be confused with aphids if you don't have a magnifying glass, which is one of the reasons why I want you to get them. They're going to be very pale green, very tiny and oval shaped, but they may have a waxy covering on their body, so that's going to separate them from aphids. Aphids tend to be bare. They don't tend to have any kind of covering on them. These guys will have a waxy covering that's going to help protect them from predators. And then finally, of course, the adults. 
you're going to see a very small moth-like insect flying around or sitting on the surface of leaves. If you look at them, you're going to see that their wings are going to kind of form a triangular roof shape on their backs. And that is a very telltale sign that you're looking at a white fly or something related. Think of when you see a cicada. And when you see a cicada and its wings are folded on its back, they kind of slant downwards at angles, forming that kind of roof shape. It's the same deal with white flies. Okay, so like I said, we're going to cover some methods of controlling them in a little bit. For right now, I want to move on to our spider mites. Um, some of you have probably experienced spider mites before. They are a very unfortunate pest to have. Um, when I was a graduate student, I was growing soybeans in a greenhouse for my experiments, and I got spider mites so very often. Uh, they are a challenge to get rid of, unfortunately. Now, these can occur in greenhouses and indoors, but I also want to point out that they can occur in outdoor gardens as well. Now, they are not an insect. They are actually more closely related to spiders and scorpions, so they're not going to have the same kind of life cycle or do the same things that an insect will do. The damage they cause may look somewhat similar, but there are some differences. But to all of you, essentially, they're going to be damaging leaves, they're going to cause stippling, and they're going to produce this telltale stringy webbing that crosses between leaves and across stems, and it's going to be, that is going to be the most obvious part of it. Now, again, I want to encourage you to get that magnifying glass. Most of the spider mites we have are known as two-spotted spider mites, that particular species. And when you see them, sometimes you can even see them with the naked eye, you'll see a very tiny shape that has two distinct black spots on it. And if we go back to our picture here, you can kind of see what that looks like. But if you have your magnifying glass, you can take a close look and you'll be able to see it very, very clearly. The easiest sign that I always look for is the webbing first off and foremost. Now, you, this will not be like spider webbing. It'll look a little bit similar, but it's going to be much different. For one, it's not going to be sticky. Spider webbing sticks to you. This stuff just makes it so that the mite can move more easily across surfaces, and it helps protect them a little bit from other predators because they'll get tangled in it. So I kind of went over this already. One thing that I want to add to this is that warm temperatures can cause the population to explode very, very quickly. So if you're bringing plants inside, make sure, one, the plants aren't already infested, and two, make sure you're paying attention to what the temperatures are in the areas that you're keeping them in. In my personal experience, I found that high temperatures and dry air seem to be great for spider mites. Um, moisture is usually required to start them off, but they seem to thrive when conditions are drier in a home or a greenhouse. Um, now that is, like I said, just my personal experience. The best thing to do is to make sure that you monitor your plants when you're bringing them inside. And that's going to go for all of the insects and other things we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, I already mentioned that they will produce stippling on a leaf surface. Now, the difference between them and a white fly is that you're going to see the tissue take on a bronzed appearance before the leaves turn yellow. And this can be easily confused with drought stress on plants. That bronzed appearance comes from the fact that the way this mite feeds is a little bit different than other insects. They're doing a different type of damage to the leaf surface. So you can use that to help separate out what's happening to your plant. Remember that bronzed appearance that may look like drought stress. Okay, just keep it on rolling through our insect and related pests, mealybugs. Mealybugs are one of the nastier ones, unfortunately. Um, most often, the only tactic you have available to you is to simply monitor everything you bring indoors. Now, mealybugs are, again, related to white flies. They are a sap-feeding insect. These aren't like scales, however. Scale insects are going to sit still on the leaf surface that they attach to. They're pretty much never going to move. A mealybug, however, doesn't have the hard covering of a scale. It's covered in this kind of powdery, waxy stuff that sits on top of its back that provides protection. 
these insects will move across leaves and stems, finding other locations to feed on the leaf. They're going for softer areas where they can get their mouth parts in and begin draining that leaf tissue of its liquid contents. You need to constantly monitor plants when you bring them inside for mealybugs. Look for a kind of white, waxy formation at leaf nodes and on stems and on the surface of leaves. That's going to be your indicator that mealybugs are present. Now I'm going to go over some control methods for mealybugs now because they differ a little bit from the other ones. One that I want to note here is that if you see individual bugs, you can actually use a little bit of alcohol and like a cotton ball and dip them onto the individuals and that should kill them. But I want you to keep in mind that this means that these insects require a lot more manual labor to be able to get rid of. You're going to have to, if you have mealybugs and you've identified that that's what it is, you're going to have to keep doing this as time goes on to make sure that you've gotten all of them and they're not trying to somehow reproduce or they're not that they're hiding under leaf surfaces or things like that. One interesting fact about mealybugs is that some of them you see may be darker in color. This is because another insect has parasitized them. They've laid their eggs in the mealybug and their young are actually going to consume that insect from the inside out. So offering you a, a little bit of help, but don't treat that as like a biocontrol agent. That's not going to be a reliable thing. Um, you can try to use some systemic insecticides on the plants that you brought indoors to try to control them. Um, just again, like I always tell people when it comes to insecticides, Contact your extension uh, educator or agent wherever you are uh, before you try to use one of these and always, always follow label directions that is for your safety. Okay, a little bit about aphids here. Um, I have a few slides where I just briefly touch on a few different insects, but I don't include much information on them. I'm going to double check and see if it, okay, good. So you guys have probably seen plenty of aphids in your own home gardens. Aphids are kind of the legendary locust is what I typically think of, though locusts are actually a grasshopper species. The reason I say this is because aphids reproduce at a rate that is mind-boggling. Um, there is a reason behind this. So these are sap feeders, just like most of the other insects that we've talked about. They're going to stay very still on a plant. They're usually going to feed for about 10 to 15 minutes at a time, and they're not going to move much. You can find them indoors as well as in gardens, in trees, and other places. I've seen aphid infestations so bad in trees that aphids are actually falling out of the trees and they'll rain off you, which is kind of gross. Um, but going to that reason why they seem to reproduce so quickly. When aphids are in their most pestiferous stage, when they're the biggest problem, they're at a point in their life cycle where they are born and they're not winged. All they can do is walk, but they are born such that the next generation is an exact clone of the previous one. They don't require a male individual to mate with them. Mothers simply produce their own daughter clones, and they can do this at an incredible speed. I like to joke that aphids are practically born pregnant, and that's not that far from the truth. This is why you can have 10 aphids one day, and the next day you have 150 of them. It's a very good strategy they use. Now, when aphids feed, they can cause plant stunting and yellowing of leaves. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this before. Aphids are also the biggest criminals when it comes to the production of sooty mold due to honeydew, that sugary excrement that they get rid of and they spread across the leaves as they move around. And of course, they could spread very easily due to their reproductive cycle, which I kind of talked about, which is why it's so important that you monitor your plants, and check any plant that you bring inside. All right, so talk a little bit about some indoor management of insects. This is going to be the general information. Now, if you guys have particular questions on managing an insect or you're not sure how to identify it, go ahead, throw that in the chat. We will answer that towards the end of this. So like I broke down in the beginning, there are three steps to this. Prevention, monitoring, and sanitation. Now, the prevention is easy. It's exactly what I've been saying this whole time. Check your plants. Do not bring an infested plant inside. 
make sure you clean the insects off of it. Or if it's a really bad infestation, you may just want to give up on that plant and plan to reseed for the next season. In terms of monitoring, once it's inside, I have seen a lot of gardeners or a lot of hobbyist gardeners who will bring in their basil or their lavender or what have you. They'll check them once and then they'll wait a month and then check them again when they remember or when they have time. Don't do this. Don't be that guy. Check them weekly. Check them daily almost if you want to. If you keep up good monitoring, you will save yourself lots of issues. You don't want to try to handle a plant that suddenly has a massive outbreak of spider mites, especially when they can spread to the other plants that you may have already inside or other ones you're bringing inside. Now, sanitation is going to be the key to keeping the insects off our plants and killing the ones that are already there. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It is cleaning the plants using something as simple as a wet cloth or soapy water to just wipe the insects away. Remember, a lot of these guys don't move around very well. They are going to be sitting there and feeding for an extended period of time. They don't stand up well to someone just walking up to them with a cloth and wiping them right off. There are also insecticidal soaps, horticultural oils, and a variety of other products that you can buy that are perfectly safe, and you can apply them to your plants and use those to clean. All right, I think I've covered everything I want to talk about there. Um, one thing I do want to mention, though, is that normally when it comes to indoor plant care, I don't have great recommendations for an exact insecticide to use, like something you can spray on, because most often I find that that is overdoing it. Um, in greenhouse situations, it is a somewhat different story, and they may have someone on staff who can use harsher insecticides and be able to implement an integrated pest management program. But for the case of you just taking care of your plants in your home, that simply isn't necessary. Really what it comes down to is just some good old-fashioned elbow grease and monitoring efforts, and those are going to be the best ways to solve almost all of your insect problems. All right, so I wanted to mention diseases of indoor plants, and I wanted to talk a lot about this, but as I was putting together the information for this evening, I realized something. We have already talked about this. Um, when we did a program during this previous summer and uh, into the fall, we talked a lot about the diseases of several plants outside, including most of the ones that you will bring indoors. And when I checked what those diseases were, they were the exact same ones. So what I want to encourage all of you to do is go and onto our YouTube channel, and I can put another link to this in the email tomorrow, and look up those programs. They talk a lot about bacterial leaf spot, fungal leaf spot, and things like that. Um, these are the, this list here is just a short list of diseases that you may encounter on your plants. And like I said, we've already talked about it. Now, what I am going to do is I'm going to talk about ways that you can avoid those diseases because we've already got the information out there that you can see on what to look for, how to identify them. But now I just want to focus on what you can do to avoid them. And that's going to start and primarily revolve around the watering needs of the plants themselves. Now, I know a lot of gardeners just simply operate by the principle of they have a schedule, they're going to take a bucket of water out to their garden, they're going to make sure they water it to whatever level they feel is necessary, and to try to take the best care of their plants they can. And when you bring those plants inside, it's drier inside. So you're going to make sure that that soil is good and moist, you're going to water it thoroughly, you're going to make sure it's going to last, and you're going to come back to it when it dries out and just keep up that habit. The trouble is, our different plants have different watering requirements, and when they enter the winter, their watering requirements are much different. Plants are going to go into a resting phase if they're perennial plants, and they're simply not going to take up that much water. Now, this has to be balanced, though, with when we bring them inside, we have the heat on. Like right now in my home, I'm pretty sure our heat's on. I think I hear it running right now. That means that the humidity levels in my house are low. There isn't much water in the air. So that means that when I 
go downstairs and I see that there's a plant that needs watered, I'm going to have to take into account that while this plant may have reduced watering needs, it's also really dry and the soil could be very dry too. So it's kind of a little bit of a guessing game and a little bit of a balancing act to make sure that you're getting those plants the water they need, but you're not giving them too much. Because if the plant is not uptaking that water, that means it's going to sit there. And if you have sitting water, if you guys have attended any of my other programs, you know that that is a bad situation. That is when fungal diseases can start, and those are going to be the biggest problems that you'll encounter when taking care of your plant inside. Now, when you are going to water, I want you to take this step because this is going to help you avoid some of those fungal diseases. Apply it directly to the soil. Don't shower the plant. Don't sprinkle it over the leaves. When water sits on leaf tissue, that means that there could be a fungal pathogen that can take root right there. That is the exact situation they need. Put the water directly onto the soil. Also consider moving plants into an area of your home that has higher humidity. Um, you guys know your homes. You know which areas are probably going to hold humidity the best. Hopefully that's also an area where sunlight is going to be at its best, though I know sometimes it may be harder. So if you can't place a plant where there's higher humidity, make sure you alter your watering practices to account for that. Check your soil. You can usually check by just simply pushing your finger into the soil. And if it's an inch down and it's still pretty dry, you need to consider doing some watering. But if it's moist, go ahead and hold off on it. Remember, these plants are in a resting state. They are not going to need as much water. Now, when I say this, I want to also remind you guys, this is for perennial plants. This is for plants that are actually supposed to make it to the next year. I know a lot of us will bring in plants that are annuals, and we can even make those annuals survive to the next season. We've got a basil plant in my home right now that is supposed to be one of the um, annual varieties, and it's survived for about three years now. So it's going to follow a different set of rules, and none of those are very clear, unfortunately. So I kind of went over the develop or the watering needs. Part of that reason, the plant is growing more slowly. You don't want to do anything to this plant that doesn't simply account for leaf loss. Unless you're intentionally trying to make the plant grow more. But I know a lot of us, we just want to simply keep the plant alive so we can move it back outside once the uh, warmer seasons get here. This way, you aren't trying to force the plant to do something it wouldn't normally do, which can be very stressful depending on the situation. And you're taking care of that disease issue. Now, one thing I do want to add to the end of this, of course, I've talked your ear off about overwatering, but I also want to add, don't let water sit in the bottom pan for more than half an hour. If the soil and the plant haven't taken the water up by then, they aren't going to. So if the water has sit there for a half an hour, go ahead, dump it, put the pan back onto the plant and move on. All right, so the next important bit, taking care of our plants, and this one is the one that we don't have a whole lot of control over, unfortunately, is the amount of light that our plants are getting. Um, let's face it, we're in Indiana. When it gets uh, wintertime here, it gets dark. I'm sitting in a room right now where I already need to consider turning on the lights. And unfortunately, it's only going to get worse from here. Now, no matter what, no matter where you stick your plants, if they are inside your home, they are simply not going to get as much light as though they were outside. Our windows have natural filters on them. Um, the windows may need cleaned. Um, or there could be trees that will obscure and add shade to your windows at different times of day. It's just not as easy a situation as to control where you're placing your garden in your yard. So we need to account for that. Uh, the things that you need to consider when you're choosing locations where to put your plants. Uh, now, I'm not going to comment on how well we clean our homes. I'm simply going to say that if your window has a lot of dirt on it, that's obstructing light. You also want to consider what direction are these windows facing. If you have east-facing windows and they get a lot of sunlight in the morning, that's great. But if you have a plant that needs about 12 hours of sunshine a day, you may have a problem. Also consider the clarity of the window. Like I said, a lot of our windows have UV filtering on them. 
And you need to keep that in mind because that's going to cause an impact on the amount of light that your plant is getting. It may just not be noticeable by you. The other thing, like I mentioned, the time of year. During winter time, we aren't getting a full 12 hours of sunshine a day. Sometimes I feel like it's lucky if we get four hours of sunshine a day during the winter. Um, and that means that you may need to supplement your light with something artificial. Now, the questions that you need to be asking yourself when you're planning your placement. What are the needs of the plant? Is this plant shade loving or do they need full or partial sunlight? Uh, this should be information you already have when you chose to put the seed in the ground. So just refer back to that information. Remember what kind of plant that you're dealing with here. Consider how long the area gets it. Remember what I was talking about, those east facing windows. And remember, as the sun um, and it moves across the sky and as the year goes around, the sun is going to shift its direction a little bit. Uh, the process is called precession, if anyone has ever heard of it. And what this is, is that as our Earth is revolving around the sun, that's moving its angle, so it may not be at the same angle throughout the entire winter. You're going to need to account for that. And of course, you're going to want to consider what obstructions are there. Is there a nice big oak tree outside that it provides shade in your kitchen over a certain amount of time? Or is there another tree at another place where it seems to cover that area? You want to make sure that you are accounting for this. All right, fertilizing. Now this one I would be surprised if a lot of you are doing, um, but I wanted to touch on it at least a little bit just in case. Now I'm going to preface this by saying there's normally very little reason to fertilize the plants you've brought indoors for the winter. I would generally just not even consider it. I mean, these plants are going into a resting state. They probably don't have the same needs. But I want to make sure that if you do choose to, that you have some information to work with. So, like I mentioned earlier, any fertilization you do should only be done to replace leaf loss and only on growing plants. If your plant is pretty much static, it's not really growing, it's not putting out new leaves or anything like that, but it's also not losing them, don't put fertilizer down. If you put fertilizer in your soil and it just sits there, you're creating a situation where there could be other things that could grow in the soil, say random seeds that you may have picked up from the outside, uh, potentially unwanted fungi might be able to take advantage of it, and if it sits there, you run the risk of burning the plant too. Now, if you choose to fertilize, always follow the label directions on it. Uh, remember, this stuff can be pretty potent. Generally, just a dab will do you with these things. Follow those label directions. Now, when it comes to indoor plants, and I say indoor plants because this will count for your regular house plants as well, um, consider your micronutrients. Because if you ha are bringing in your favorite basil plant and you bring it in with some of the soil that it was already in, um, a, you're probably putting it in some potting media, some kind of potting soil or something else, sphagnum moss, what have you, to give them that growing media. But that stuff may lack in certain micronutrients. So if you want to fertilize, consider buying one that is labeled for micronutrients, the very uh, different nutrients that have very small, that come in very small amounts that the plant may need. Uh, generally, that potting soil may just generally lack that. The other thing I would suggest is consider your magnesium content in your soil. Usually when we do watering for our indoor plants, that magnesium will leach out with the water as it bonds with the water molecules. And you're going to want to help uh, provide that if you feel like your plant is lacking. Normally in most potted plants, one or two teaspoons of Epsom salts will normally take care of the job. I wouldn't put anything more than that in there or else you're going to start forcing the pH of your soil to move a little bit. And you don't want to have that happen. But like I said at the beginning of this, fertilization is probably not something that you're going to need to worry about. Most of the time, your plants are at rest. They're going into their winter phase and they're not really going to need much of anything. Now, a situation where you might consider it is if you have an annual. Uh, if you're bringing in like a basil that you know will survive through the winter, but it's still an annual, or maybe you want it to grow a little more during the winter months, 
that's something you might personally consider. It might do you some good there. But always take a little bit of care. And if you're not sure, you can always contact your extension educator and we will help you figure that information out. All right, so I'm staying fairly brief tonight. I'm going to touch on just a few more plants here individually for some information. Now, one thing I will warn you about is some of this information is a little bit hard to come by. So there's not a whole lot here. Um, I would encourage you for your individual plant needs, like a basil or a lavender or what have you, contact your extension educator so we could take a deeper dive into this. And I'm kind of thinking after going through some of this information, I'd like to produce a, maybe another program that takes a deep dive into an individual plant. So if you feel like that's something you'd benefit from when I send out those surveys tomorrow, just let me know and I'll make sure to um, start making a program for that. All right, so our basil. So basils are one of our favorite plants, especially to bring inside. We love them as a part of our food. Uh, now, the, one of the most common basils that we like is sweet basil, and it is an annual. Now, you can make sweet basil survive quite a long time um, if you bring it inside and keep moving it back outside regularly. Like I said, the basil plant that I have downstairs has survived a significant amount of time longer than what it should have eventually it will die off. This is not something you can help. Um, plants and other organisms have something that's called programmed cell death. At some point, their genetics will just start to kill them because they're supposed to reproduce. Now, there are a few different tactics that you can make, uh, that you can use to make them last a little bit longer, like pinching off seed pods and things like that. But if you really want to have a basil that you can bring inside and bring back outside and just keep it as long as possible, um, you really should consider a perennial basil. Now, basil plants are a little bit tough to deal with during the winter months because they do require a lot of sunlight. They require about 10 to 12 hours of direct light. So if you're planning on keeping it inside during the winter, you need to consider some artificial lighting. Um, unfortunately, there's just not a whole lot of help for that. These are um, generally subtropical plants, so their needs are going to be a little bit more intense. Uh, try to keep the plant warmer. I know that that can be a little bit of a challenge for our homes, especially in the winter. Um, there are some areas of my home that get a lot colder, but unfortunately those are the same areas that get the most light. So if you are trying to keep your basil going, you may have to deal with the fact that you're just going to have to restart from seeds at some point. All right, so caring for some lavender. Uh, we recently got some lavender, my wife and I, from a friend of ours who just moved. So we were thinking about this recently. Caring for lavender through the winter is a little bit similar to basil. However, lavender has a few more benefits. So there are several varieties that can survive outside in the winter. Um, you're looking for hardy species like our English, our English species or the Lavandin types. Um, you can even water them while it's outside in the winter. You just want to make sure the ground isn't frozen. And uh, if you've lived in, Indi in Indiana for any amount of time, you know that that ground can freeze pretty hard after a certain time of year. So you're going to have to take that into account if you're going to help it survive. There are some areas where you can plant the lavender to try to keep it warmer longer. Closer to concrete, closer to the side of the home will help it not, it'll help the ground to not freeze and lavender can survive in that area. Um, I will warn you against using the more tender varieties such as Spanish lavender. Um, they're not going to survive outside very well. They're in that subtropical category. They are not hardy in zones five and six. So if you're, if you want those varieties, you're going to need to bring them inside and you're going to need to treat them pretty similar to basil. They're going to need a lot of sunshine. You want to keep them warm. You want to make sure that you're taking care of their watering needs. The good thing is though, they are still perennial. They are not annual species. All right. And I wanted to touch on this because a lot of you really seem to enjoy the rose program that I gave. So this one's going a little off the edge here because I've been talking about indoor plants the whole time. Um, I don't know if anyone actually brings their roses indoors for the winter. Or I'm sure someone probably has, but I'm going to focus on just a few of the things you do to help preserve your roses outside. Um, when I was growing up, my mother used to always just cover her roses with a styrofoam cone. 
and it made me a little curious, so I looked up some more information on how you take care of roses when winter gets here. So, of course, like a lot of the things I've talked about, plant hardy varieties. Um, we are in zones five and six here, so some roses just simply aren't going to do well outside. When you are planning to cover them, don't cover until there's been a hard killing frost. That'll remove the leaves, it'll cause the plant to initiate its dormancy cycle and make it much easier to take care of. The important part of this is that you want to prevent alternating warming and freezing. And here in Indiana, we definitely ex have experienced that for the last several years. And we even experienced that during our spring period uh, with that really nasty freeze we got awful late. Now, there are a few different tactics that people use to cover them. Mounding or hilling is one. So mounding can be that you're covering the rose uh, plant with like straw or compost or a mulch, and you're just covering the plant in its entirety. And that way the plant can stay warm, it can stay insulated, and the temperature shouldn't vary a whole lot. Or you can use your traditional styrofoam rose cone. And that will help insulate the plant and the air inside and force it to stay a more regulated temperature. And that way it won't shift a whole lot. Now the things that I want you guys to consider before you cover your roses is that you may need to do a little bit of pruning. Um, you don't want to smash in all of your uh, roses, leaves and stems and branches into a rose cone over the winter. You may accidentally damage the plant. So once the plant enters a dormancy cycle or when it's starting to wind down for the year, go ahead, prune it up a little bit so that way it's going to fit in and you won't have bits poking out of your mound or your hill or bits that are going to get crushed in your rose cone. Exposed parts can be vulnerable to freezing and that can damage the plants and ultimately your roses just won't come back as well in the following year unless you baby it a lot. All right, folks. I think that is what we had for you this evening, and I kept the time fairly good. So um, do any of you have any questions? We went through that kind of quick. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or go ahead and enter it in the chat. 